Oh, no. and, uh, okay, so this is, this is the last uh, part of this little section of power speed uh, and agility. Hopefully, I've, I've re jigged my machine tonight and done it slightly differently, as you can see. And uh, I suppose it would have had things because he would be speaking about himself <laughs> on the screen anyway. So, we've looked at prayer, we've looked at, you know, looked at the different aspects of prayer, the different rules of prayer. And the irony of this is each of these things that we're taking one night on. I we could speak six months on each one of them, so I think some of them we'll have to come back to. Like tonight, tonight you could spend a year on to really just lend some foundations tonight, and then I think that some of them we'll probably have to, to pick up at a later stage and go into deeper. But I wanted to give a foundation and overview because for some people, supernatural is weird and wonderful, and, and it's not weird and wonderful, and we we'll want to just talk about that. So we're talking about prayer, we're talking about the power to change and, and even Sunday nights that has sort of come through <coughs> about the power to change and, and even on <coughs> Sunday night we're talking about spiritual warfare I'm saying well, the spiritual warfare so often starts in us and with us first. Last week we talked about vision, we had trouble with our vision because the Wi-Fi was dropping <laughs> but the importance of vision and without a vision the people perish. And so tonight in this ability to, because uh, remember our subject is uh, speed, power, and agility. So if we're going to have speed, power, and agility in the spirit. Or as a Christian, we need these are some of the things we need. So supernatural. So we want to talk a little bit about the supernatural. So Father, we, we pray tonight, Lord, that as we study your word, that you will really reveal the Lord things to us that we maybe haven't known, things that we haven't seen before, Lord, maybe things from a different perspective. Lord, you give us a broader uh, and a really broad understanding, Lord of this whole area of the supernatural and Lord what it means to us and how we can walk and operate in that area, Father in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're not, we're not going to be probably raising the dead after tonight, but we'll have an understanding of why we can raise the dead maybe after tonight. And so people are always interested in the supernatural. In Jesus' day here we had the Pharisees with all the people in John 6, 30 now. The thing that really aggravates me about this is Jesus just after feeding the 5,000, if you were to read the portion before this. And so they say, and so he just fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes, and they still say, so they say to him, uh, What sign attesting a miracle will you do that we may see and believe you? And think, What you want to have to do? And this is why it's not about the miraculous, and, and it's not about the supernatural. First and foremost, and I remember the time of the uh, the guy with the tattoos, uh, Todd Bentley, and there was a whole thing of, of people being healed, and everybody was was really into that, and everybody was wanting to have a Todd Bentley person at your church, and it was about the miraculous, and everything was about the miraculous. And I said, here's the trouble with people: if you raise four dead this week, somebody will be in the middle of the race six dead next week and ten next week. And so people then get their eyes up actually the Lord and they're looking for the supernatural, they're looking for the spectacular. And these people were those sort of people. Jesus had already fed 20,000 people because said there was 5,000 men. And men we know it's hard to get out without the women. And you can't leave the kids at home because of their trouble. So the rack was maybe 20,000 people there. So when you give us a sign, what sort of sign are you going to do that you believe in? What supernatural work will you do as proof? And so I just, I just find this amazing that just we talked about these Pharisees and these people on Sunday, just they were so false and they could speak out of every side of their, their mouth. And so the supernatural, the funny thing about the word supernatural, supernatural was first used as a word in 1520. Now, you say, well, why would that be? Because that's a long time after, you know, when you think, well, when Jesus was around, and you think when the healings he was doing, the supernatural would be a word that was used throughout history. Because people actually didn't differentiate, because they believed in a supernatural world, because they understood the spirits, because they believed in the angels, and they believed in God, the supernatural was part of their natural life. That interesting. So when you go to Africa, for instance, when we go to Africa, if you've been to Africa, the supernatural is no big deal to them. They believe in the supernatural. It could be a bad supernatural, it could be a good supernatural. I know when we were in uh, 
was one of the islands in, in the middle of Lake Victoria. We were there and we were speaking and the pastor was speaking and, and one of the guys who had been there before said, you see those four guys standing there, they're the witch doctors. Now they didn't have a bone through their nose or anything like that, but they, these guys could levitate you and could put a curse on you and could, they had these things that had locks and, and so they took a lock so if you fell out with them or didn't pay them your protection money, from, from home, they would have took a lock and they snapped the lock. That meant your life was over. It was only a matter of days before you died. And people actually were dying. They snapped the lock over your life. That was your life over unless you paid them or bribed them or did whatever you did. So the supernatural is a very real world. In the West, we tend not to, people generally don't believe in the supernatural. But if you go to India, you go to Africa, particularly Africa, uh, and Eastern cultures, the supernatural people believe in the supernatural. And so that's one of the reasons that it wasn't a word that came into vocabulary in this part of the world, in the UK and in the West, maybe. So <clears throat> the definition, the dictionary definition that was first used was something that was, wasn't subject to the laws of physics, something that existed above and beyond nature. So that, that makes sense. Now, I love this, seen this recently, and the, this is the modern Catholic dictionary, but I like what the definition they give. Now, of course, this is talking about the good side of the supernatural. And so the sum total of heavenly destiny and all the divinely established means of reaching that destiny, which surpasses the mere powers and capabilities of human nature. And so it's not something we can do in our own strength. It's not something we can do by our own means. It's something that has to be something divine. Now, we understand some of that has been taken to a bit of an extreme, but the basis and the principle of that definition is good. The supernatural is something that we can't do in the natural. It's something outside our natural strength, our, our mere part, the, the, the mere powers and capabilities of the human nature. And so, I want to sort of try and clear up a few misconceptions and misunderstandings about the supernatural, because most Christians even uh, think that the supernatural is for special people, or it's for a special place, so it's only in church, for instance, not for the, the streets. And yet, if you look at the miraculous and what Jesus did, 90% of the miracles happened outside of the church, and, and very few happened inside of the church. Or they believe it's for special periods of time. So, if you take Northern Ireland as a Christian country, probably 70% of the denominations in this country don't believe that there is a supernatural for today, they don't believe in the gifts of the spirit, they don't believe in healing, that they, they have what they call a cessationist teaching, so these things stopped when the last uh, apostle of the Lamb died or the canon of scripture was put in place depending on what their particular belief is. So people have this thing, well I, I couldn't be involved in the supernatural, I'm not a special person, I'm not the priest or the minister or whoever. I'm just a lay person, uh, or they think, well, we need to be in a special place, we need to be wherever it happens to be, Lourdes, or church, or depending on what background you're coming from, or it's for a special dispensation. And of course, when Jesus died on the cross, he opened up grace, and that we talked about it Sunday morning, the, the curtain was cut in two, and that opened up access up into the very presence of God. So we'll go we'll, we'll through some of these things. So we're going to look at a lot of scriptures tonight. Because at the end of the day, the scripture is the thing that informs. My opinion is no good to anybody. My opinion is not worth diddly squat, and neither is yours, <laughs> as a matter of fact. But the Bible, what the Bible tells us is really important. So we can only get a true picture of, of God's supernatural uh, by studying the life of Jesus, <coughs> his instructions to us, and from, te from the teaching received from the word. Now, I don't know who said this, but I heard this a long time ago. Most Christians get their information about the supernatural from Hollywood rather than the Holy Word. And uh, so most people can tell you about the omen or the, all the, the yes, the exorcist or all these different, the, the TV is full of this weird and wonderful stuff. And Christians seem to be into it and they know more about the supernatural channel or whatever it's called that does all this stuff and then they know about the word and so people I am still amazed that Christians still do charms and read teacup get teacups read and 
read their what you call stars and all this sort of stuff. Amazing. Uh, and yet they'll not turn to the word to see what God has to say. So uh, it's not just the world. There, there are many people who claim to be Christians who, who struggle with this stuff. So we want to really have a little look at this whole area of supernatural beginning with, with Jesus and, and then the birth of the church and, and what the, the season that we're living in, if you like. And here we find John in Luke uh, chapter 3. Uh, and this is in the, the message uh, translation. John is having this whole debate and conversation with the Pharisees and, and the, the Jewish people. And he's saying, look, I'm not the Christ. The Christ's coming after me. My, the, what I'm teaching you is a, is a baptism of repentance, looking forward for the Messiah to come. And so they're having this debate. And John intervenes. He said, I'm baptizing or immersing you in the river. But he will baptize you, and so to baptize just means to immerse, to immerse, it's not terribly, if you're going to, you, if you're dying, you used, years ago you used to dye jeans, anybody ever dye jeans? Don't tend to do it now, it's, too, it's cheaper to buy a new pair than buy the dye, but if you dye them, you just, you immerse them in the bucket of dye and you left them there white and they come out a different colour or whatever. So it's not a, comp, it's not a particularly special spiritual word, it just means to, to immerse something. But he will baptize you, ignite the kingdom life, a fire, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of your lives. He will place everything true in its proper place before you. Everything false he'll put out with the trash to be burned. Now if you're a King James person, or a new King James, the King James says he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, when I was a little boy, I'd tell you this story. They always talked about the Holy Ghost. And, and so you went to a meeting and said, the Holy Ghost. And, and so there was people actually who were divided. So people who said the Holy Spirit, they said they were a cult. They were false. And the people who said the Holy Ghost, they said they were the true believers. Who they believe in the Holy Ghost. And those people over here who believe in the Holy Spirit, they thought they were a bit iffy. So we've come a long way since those days. So I don't care what terminology you use, we're talking about the same thing, we're talking about the third person of the Trinity, God the Spirit, uh, And but it's interesting, uh, and if you take that translation, he'll baptise you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, to use that older translation, fire speaks of purification, but fire also creates energy, if you have a, a steam locomotive, you need a fire to get the steam going, so it speaks of, of two things, so he'll immerse you in the Holy Spirit, but he will also clean you up, as this is saying. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. So when you become a Christian, when, when God fills you or baptizes you or immerses you, however you, want to, however you want to term it, with the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, he doesn't only forgive your sins. And just think of the supernatural. You see, some people try to live the Christian life in the natural, and yet you can't, because how supernatural is this? You're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we sin, that's what we've done. We come and we say a few words in repentance. We recognize that Jesus is the Savior. We come and we say, Lord, I repent, I recognize I'm a sinner, I recognize you're a Savior, you're the Savior. Please forgive me, I receive you into my heart, I receive you to be my Savior. Bring me into your family and give me eternal life. And he does it like that. If that's not supernatural... I don't know what supernatural is. Because if we don't come that route, the Bible says anybody that doesn't come that way is not a thief. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, they've got a false religion. So some people are trying to work their way to salvation through works and all these other things. So they're trying to, have a, to, to live a supernatural Christian life in the natural. And you, you can't do it. So even our birth, as we want to say in a little minute or two, our new birth is supernatural. And for those of it, all of us here, here that we're all Christians here, so we know that when we give our lives to God and He fill us with His Spirit, uh, and we've all had different experiences in relation to that, uh, He begins to place things in their proper place. So we begin to understand, we begin to see things, we begin to think, oh, that's why I went through that journey, that's why I'm like that, that's why I respond like that. And then all the stuff that's not good, He begins to burn it up, He convicts us, He doesn't condemn us, he convicts us, and then he speaks to us about dealing with stuff. So that's a that's a lifetime's journey, in a sense. The quicker we get stuff tidied up, of course, the better. 
And so, this baptism that John has been talking about, that Jesus is going to bring to us, it's a baptism of supernatural power, but it's also a baptism of supernatural purity. And I know Terry and Brenda told me about when they were involved. Who were the, who were the guys that uh, uh, you were involved with in the early days of holiness movement? What's the name of the... No. Uh, well, basically it was from the house group movements in the 70s. Yeah, but there was somebody that had a real... Who? Holy North. North. Right. Was there, was there not somebody else that was involved in that whole teaching? <coughs> There was, there was quite a few. Yeah, quite a few. You mentioned the name too me before. It was a, it was a different one you mentioned. But there was a when people many years ago talked about they talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit to use that terminology. They were talking about a baptism into holiness and into purity, and many times they left out the power. And, and so you can't have a a baptism into purity without the power. Cause you can't be otherwise trying to do it in your own strength. And so when it when it when the Bible said he will baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with power, or in that other rendering that we looked at. These two things come into our lives. We're immersed in God's Spirit. He deals with the, the sin issue. He deals with the penalty of sin that we talked about a few weeks ago. He deals with the power of sin. But then he gives us power to live and power to move in the supernatural, but power to live holy lives as well. It's a great, it's a great balance, isn't it? Because if you don't have one, if you have one without the other, then you're going to get yourself in trouble. And we've seen lots of these ministries down the road who haven't got this balance they've got a baptism of power if you like they, they understand the supernatural the power side but then they haven't got the purity side and so it's so easy to get uh, taken off course so <clears throat> john tells that the messiah is going to come he said this person that's going to come he's he's i'm just the the forerunner, I'm just preparing the way for him. My baptism is a baptism of repentance. He's going to come, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, he's going to baptize you with fire. And it was on to say then in Luke, uh, but before John's imprisonment, when he was still preaching and ritually cleansing, so that was just a ritual cleansing that, that uh, John was doing, ritually cleansing through baptism, the people in the Jordan River, Jesus also came to him to be baptized. As Jesus prayed, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit came upon him in a physical manifestation that resembled a dove. So the Holy Spirit is not a dove, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. But in this manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit resembled a dove. A voice echoed from heaven, you are my son, the son I love, in whom I take great pleasure. Mm -hmm. I love what it says here, it says, and the Holy Spirit came upon him and then we'll see what happens after that just in a minute or two but you see one of those misconceptions is now we've been doing the Apostles Creed so we've been talking about how Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit the Father the bloodline came from the Father so Jesus had no inherent sin and this is the thing we have struggled to get our head around Jesus was a man and yet he was God the Bible said he laid aside his majesty and so if you were to have a Catholic Bible, the Catholic Bible has five or so additional books called the Apocrypha and some other uh, Gospels and other things that in some editions have. So they will tell the story, stories like this. They'll say that when Jesus was a boy, he took some clay and he created a little bird and he went, like the Paul Daniels magic show, went and the, off the bird flew. So that's part of that teaching. We see... We don't believe that because we believe Jesus was a natural, Jesus was a human being. For Jesus to die for our, the penalty for our sin, he had to die as a man. He, he had to be here as a man, live a sinless, spotless life as a man. God, the Father, gave him his bloodline, but he was still fully human and fully God, but he laid aside his majesty. So Jesus couldn't do any miraculous. He couldn't move in the supernatural until the Holy Spirit came at this point. And rested in him. Now I think we say, well, why are you telling us all that? Mm. Because the church makes that as an excuse not to move in the supernatural. Because they say, well, Jesus moved in the supernatural, but he was special. Well, of course he was special. He was the Son of God, but he laid aside his majesty and he operated in everything that he did in the supernatural as a human being, anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now that's very important for us to understand because that opens up the super, supernatural to each one of us. So 
We understand Jesus as a special person. We know that. But he set aside his specialness, if you like, to walk as a human being under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to, to lead the way for us to walk in that supernatural, which is mind-blowing. And we're not even half a percent. We're not even walking in half a percent of it because we don't. We still don't fully grasp it. I've been a Christian for 40-something years and still getting to, to the... Because it just seems... Um, it seems untrue to us, and yet it's not. This is this is what the Bible teaches us. So the Holy Spirit came on him, a uh, physical manifestation resembling a dove. And we've talked about this before, about how the dove has, the Bible uses the dove many times to represent the Holy Spirit, and how the dove has three lots of main feathers uh, on either side, with three lots of three, which is nine key feathers in each wing, which signifies and there's a picture of the fruit of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, which we're going to look at also in a minute or two. So well up to date so far, that okay. Now, so the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit rests on Jesus as a man. He didn't he didn't need to be baptized for repentance. The Bible actually tells us he was baptized just to fulfill the law. And so he was he was being uh, Baptized as a young Jewish man under the law, uh, and the priest did that, and that was that he was fulfilling the law. The Bible tells us not because he, he was repenting of his sin. So after this, now I, I've highlighted these words, and this is what I love about the screen, and it's hard to do this when you don't have the screen. So after the Holy Spirit comes and writes, says, "Now Jesus began his ministry." Now you could just read that. Now Jesus began his ministry. But I think that's a significant word. I think words are very significant in the scripture. Now Jesus began his ministry, which is backing up what I'm saying about Jesus didn't do anything supernatural. He was a good person. He grew in stature. He grew in wisdom. He grew in favor with God and man, the Bible tells us. But he did that because he had no sin in him, but he did it as a human being. And so now Jesus began his ministry. So go on to the next chapter, Luke chapter 4. Now filled with the Spirit. So you see the difference up until his baptism, up until the Holy Spirit ascended. Now filled with the Spirit, Jesus returned from the Jordan River. And then the Spirit led him into the desert. Mm. Now, you think, for goodness sake, that's not a good start. And, and so sometimes we get saved. Sometimes we get filled with the Spirit or we're baptised in the Spirit and we think we feel great and it all sounds good and then all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. Well, if that's the pattern, that's okay because God's trying to prove us, God's trying to test us. So in the early days, of, uh, I know we've all probably found this at some stage and we've all given these testimonies, sometimes your prayers just seem to get answered so easily in the first weeks and months you're saved and then it's almost as if, God, where did you go? But it's as if because God's wanting to stretch us and, and get us to trust in Him and His Word and not go with feelings and all these other things. So we know Jesus went through the the, the trials and, and the testing in, in the wilderness. But Luke 4 14, then Jesus went back to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so the Spirit comes on Him, the Spirit rests on Him. He goes through those 40 days of fasting and, and, and tempted by the devil. And use, it, use the word every time, as we know, to come against the enemy. See, the devil knows the scriptures, but he's, he just knows them in here. He's not having them inspired by the Holy Spirit. And, and so he will always take the scriptures out of context, twist them, all the rest of it. So then Jesus went back to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread, spread throughout the entire region. So here's the first thing he does then. So... How does the supernatural work in practice? What's the science, if you like, of the supernatural? We're going to, that's what we want to try and discover tonight. Because otherwise it's just the supernatural becomes some spooky, scary thing. People oh, don't talk to me about the supernatural because it puts goosebumps even when you mention the word. And actually, that's how we should be living every day because we are a supernatural people. Uh, and so, but it's not the spook. We're not looking for spooky. We're looking for what God has for us. And so <clears throat> Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord. So he took the, the scroll, the Bible says, he turned up the scriptures. So he knew the scriptures, but he had to learn them just because he was God. Remember, he laid aside his majesty. He had to learn these scriptures just the way we do, like a human, an, an ordinary human being. But he knew where the scripture was. 
he knew where the scripture was about his calling as well. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. You see, here, here's two interesting words. Anointing, anointed, but because. And because doesn't sound a terribly exciting word. But God always, the supernatural always has a cause or a because. Here's what's wrong with the church. They want the supernatural so they can shake, rattle and roll and lie on the floor and speak in tongues. Well, what's good's that help? That's not helping anybody. God has always has a because for the supernatural. He has a purpose for it. So the Spirit of the Lord, we, it's so easy to learn how to do stuff. Just read the Bible. <laughs> the trouble is, all the principles are in the Bible, aren't they? So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because, this is the purpose, He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were who are oppressed. I just noticed in my Bible, I don't know how long ago I'd written this, maybe 30 years ago, that this last line means that he is going to supernaturally break people free from their debt and their oppression. And I thought, wow, I don't even remember writing that. But as I began to look at this again, I thought that's interesting. So God can intervene, Jesus can intervene in every aspect of our lives, physically, emotionally, financially, all these. So Jesus said, this is my mandate from God. This is why God has come. This is why I am anointed. This is the purpose for it. This is confirmed. You see the apostles confirming this and, and this is the apostles then after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension the apostles are preaching and they're saying you know about Jesus of Nazareth that God anointed him. That's what Jesus was known because he was anointed. Uh, has got that God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power you know how Jesus went everywhere doing good and healing those who were ruled oppressed by the devil because God was with him. So what's this word? Because this is important. We're going to look at three key words tonight that I believe give us access to the supernatural and help us to understand the supernatural. Not spooky supernatural, supernatural that can work in, an every, in our everyday lives. And uh, sometimes, it, uh, if you have to cast the de a devil out of somebody, well, that could be. I remember the first time I had to pray for somebody that was had a demon. I don't know if possessed or oppressed or what they were, but they slithered along the, well, maybe not the first time, one of the times, they slithered along the floor like a snake. And, and this person was not the shape of a snake. This person was, this lady was that height and probably as heavy as me. And it's amazing that somebody can slither like a snake under that shape. So that was quite interesting. And, and so we're not looking for spooky, but if we are confident in knowing who we are and understand the supernatural, if spooky comes, well then we tell it to wise up. Uh, and, and so we, but we need to be confident in God and in the Word uh, and in what God has called us to do and be. So don't go looking for it. Some people are glory hunters and demon hunters. At the same time, it was interesting, and this is not our subject at the minute, but John Heenan said something interesting in, in the men's prayer meeting one day. He said, what was the most miracle, in what area did these Jesus do the most mir miracles? And I said, blind eyes, I couldn't think it was six o'clock in the morning. I said, John, ask us an easier question, it's too early. He said, casting out demons. Now, I never went round to check and out whether that was right or not, but when you do think about it, Jesus cast out a lot of demons. And we're not casting a lot of demons out of people today. We maybe need to be. Uh, but if, if they were around then, they're around today, aren't they? Uh, so it's just something we need to we need to be aware of without getting frightened about it. And so <clears throat> the apostles are saying here, you know that Jesus of Nazareth, that God anointed him. And so, what about us? Because that's okay about Jesus. Even though I'm telling us, and even though we're talking, and even though we can see it from the scriptures, we still think there's something different about Jesus and the rest of us. And there is his bloodline was from the Father. We understand that he's the Son of God. But we have to keep reminding ourselves he laid aside his majesty. He laid aside those divine rights so that he could be a, so that he could lead the way for us to understand. We, Jesus started a new race of people. Effectively, uh, Adam started a race of people, sinful people. Jesus started a race of people that were righteous, anointed people, sons and sons and daughters of God. Uh, and so sometimes we 
we live, we're living at a very low level of understanding sometimes about what we all are. So here's what, here's what the word says, but to as many as did receive and walk in him, speaking of Jesus, he gave the right, he gave the authority, he gave the privilege to become children of God. That is, to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. There's another, I have that in big bold right, and there's a clue to how we move in the, the supernatural. Who believe in his name, who were born not of blood through natural conception. Well, well, we, well we were born of blood, natural conception, but this is not what, what this is talking about. Nor of the will of flesh, physical impulse, nor of the will of man, that of a natural father, but of God. That is a divine and supernatural birth. They were born of God, spiritually transformed, renewed, and sanctified. So as we sit here tonight, here's what God's saying about us. Okay, you may have had an earthly dad. Obviously, we had not weren't created out of the test tube. I don't think any of us. I know the test tube babies and all that sort of thing now, but we probably weren't. But we were born of God. So but we were born of God. That is a divine and supernatural birth. So how could we... It's impossible to live the Christian life in the natural, isn't it? it? It doesn't make sense because we are born, we are born, we're a supernatural race of people. Whether we fully understand it, whether we even knew it at all, we have a divine and supernatural birth. We're born of God, spiritually transformed, renewed and sanctified. That's a miracle in itself. So here we were, we were sinners, we come to Jesus. One minute we're sinners, we're in the kingdom of darkness. We pray the prayer, we believe, the Bible says, the next minute we're in the kingdom of his dear son. And we have, we have the righteousness of Jesus imputed to us. And so when God looks on us, he doesn't see us. And so this is why I, you know, I always tell people off, say, well, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Well, we were an old sinner, but now we're saved by grace. We're now, actually, the Bible says we're saints, so we're no longer sinners. If we're sinning, we need to wise up and catch ourselves up. Uh, and so, we, we, are, we, we are sinners. We've been saved by grace. The Bible actually calls us saints. It's interesting when you go to the Vatican and you see all the people who have been beautified or beatified or whatever it is they call it. And it's a great system that they have because you have to be dead about 300 years to be a saint because at the end of the day there's no skeletons come out of your, your cupboard. But God takes the chance on us. He says, the minute you're born again, I'm calling you a saint, which is, which is amazing. So we should start calling each other saint and saint. <laughs> saint Michael. There's a tall store, isn't that? So, so this is this is an amazing thing. This is a supernatural birth. It's not just putting your hand up in a meeting. It's not just praying a prayer. It's supernatural. You know that, James. Mm -hmm. You know the morning. God was all over you, yeah. like a rash, for one of a better way of putting it. And so that was a that wasn't a natural thing. No. That was a supernatural thing. We've all had that. Experience in I think it was Mary has given the service that day. Yeah, So, so that's what we were born into, and, and so the disciples walked with Jesus. They they saw him operating in the supernatural. He trained them. He sent them out. We had we see different things in the Bible where this man comes to Jesus and complains about the disciples. He says, "Your disciples are useless." I'm paraphrasing. Uh, I brought my son, and he's an epileptic, and he throws himself in the fire, and they couldn't uh, help him. And Jesus, he didn't say, "Well, he more or less did say they were useless." He said, "Where's your faith? Or ye have little faith?" And, and he said, "But this." Type comes out through prayer and fasting. And so he journeyed with the disciples for three and a half years. And then just before <clears throat> Jesus is, is taken up, he, this is what he said to them in Mark 16. He said, go everywhere in the world, tell the good news to everyone. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but those who do not believe will be, will be judged guilty. The people who believe will be able to do these things as proof. So here's the supernatural signs that he's talking about. Look at the name again. They will use my name to force demons out of people. So if I'm going to pray for somebody who's demon-possessed, 
they're, they're, they're not going to listen to me. They don't catch yourself on the trumpet or whatever they would say, words to that effect. But if I step into the authority that's in Jesus' name, I, I've actually found this is quite interesting because I'm quite loud, as is Lindsay. Uh, <coughs> she takes that after me. But I have found when I've been praying for people uh, who needed deliverance, I, I'm almost whispering. It's almost when you step into that and understand the name of Jesus, you almost, it's like, I remember the first time I had to pray for someone who was demon, demonized, to say is the proper terminology. I don't care what the terminology is. When you look in their eyes and they're looking back right at you, you know there's something wrong with them. I remember going into a meeting once and I went and sat in the back row and uh, the hair stood up in the back of my neck and I, I kept looking around. Am I in a draft or is there a door open somewhere? And then this lady turned around and looked at me. And I knew why I, the hair was sitting up in the back of my neck because the lights were on, but there was nobody in. <laughs> and, and the irony is, she turned up at the church we went to on the following Sunday. Now, transparency was a primary school teacher, which was even more scary. And she stayed on at the end of the meeting. And uh, it was very obvious that she had all sorts of issues and and uh, people were praying for her at the back of church and she was on top of a pew and under a pew and she was like a dog and so the pastor in the church came over to me and said I have to go for lunch go and deal with that <laughs> so I said well, thanks very much so this woman then proceeded to tell us that she was a lesbian she had uh, she was into astral projection and silver bullets and I thought this person looking after our children or somebody's children, it's unbelievable. So I said, guys, hold on a minute here, we're, you're, we're not getting anywhere. So I said to the woman, I said, first of all, you need to repent. <coughs> you need to give your life to Jesus. And then we're going to pray, or I said, we're going to pray for you. But I said, you need to give your life to Jesus. Because I said, the Bible teaches that if you clean the house and you cast out the devil and you don't fill that vacuum, because mm -hmm. nature abhors a vacuum, the, you're going to be worse off, so we don't want to leave you worse. You're bad as it is, but we don't want to leave you worse than you are at the minute. She said, I want set free, but I'm not giving my life to anybody. Mm -hmm. well, I said, bye. Because mm -hmm. you're wasting your time. You can't, you can't do anything with that person. You can't override someone's will. Mm -hmm. No matter how anointed you are, uh, you can't override that. So we never, that woman, we never see her again. Uh, and so... But then other people know they have something in they they're wanting to be set free. And, and but so getting back to what I was saying, I have found in those situations, I've been in meetings where they're casting demons out of and they're shouting and pushing and can you think for goodness sake? Uh, the demon's not deaf. Uh, but it's the name of Jesus the demon knows. And it's like the sons of Sceva. Uh, there's a story in the Bible where the, the demon jumped on them and beat them up. Because they were they were trying to do something in the name of Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus, and, and they were trying to do it in their own strength. So the name of Jesus. So Jesus said, uh, "The people who believe will be able to do these things as proof. They will use my name to force demons out of people. They will speak." It, that's an interesting word, force, because the demons are not going to say, you know, would, "Would you mind? Uh, would you would you mind leaving this person?" See, that's what spirit, spiritual warfare, I know spiritual warfare, as we said in Sunday night, begins with us, but there actually is a spiritual warfare that, that's going on. Uh, and so we have to, you have to force them out. It says, if they uh, pick up snakes or drink any poison, they will not be hurt. If. Now, there was cults, if you like, in America, who actually had services where they brought out snakes and drunk poison. These are just head cases. Mm -hmm. Those are people who are misinterpreting the scriptures. It says, if you pick... So we see the example of Paul and the island of Patmos when he was gathering sticks and he was set in fire mm -hmm. and the viper comes out and put itself and just shook it off into the fire. Mm -hmm. Of course, then the people recognised that was a supernatural thing then. They wanted to make him a god, so he can't win. Mm -hmm. and, and so, if they pick up anything, and that doesn't mean we tempt fate, that does, for want of a better way, better word, that's not the right terminology. It doesn't mean we're stupid, but it means that God sent this word's protection, isn't it? Supernatural protection, that's what that means. They will lay their hands on sick people and they will get well. 
And so this is the thing that all amazes me. We can go, we could go to Africa and we'll go uh, in August or we go to India. We, we'll see blind eyes opening. We'll see deaf ears opening. We'll see people, we'll see all sorts of things happen. I mean, home you think, great, I'm a miracle worker. Then you come back here, nobody believes, nobody, because people have shut off the supernatural. You see, they understand there is a supernatural. There's an expectation. There's a, a belief that God moves, that God heals when you lay on hands and you pray for people. In fact, the people are queuing up. You could not, we go to India, you can't finish a service. You have to pray for everybody before you go, no matter what time of night or, or day it is. So there's an expectation that God is going to move supernaturally. Whereas our expectation is, oh, well, she'll go to the doctor first and see how it goes. If he can't do anything, we'll call in the elders and, and whatever. Of course, that's keeping Polly in the job. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this, this was, so we see Jesus, we see how Jesus was anointed. We see then Jesus saying, if you can understand the authority that's in my name, here's, here's what will happen, here's what you'll be able to do. I may not be here, but I'm sending the Spirit to you. He's going to anoint you as uh, he has anointed me. And so we see in Acts, and so nobody was called Christians at this time. They're all called disciples or people of the way or whatever. But in uh, Acts, uh, Barnabas, it says Barnabas found Saul and brought him back to Antioch. The two of them spent an entire year there, meeting with the church and teaching huge numbers of people. It was there in Antioch where the term Christian was first used to identify the disciples of Jesus. Now, actually, we as a standard term now, Christian of the Christian Church, but they were, this was a mocking term. They were mocking them, actually. And so the history of it is that they were mm, Christians, you know, sort of thing. So they were actually saying they were little Christs, and the word Christ means anointed. So they... So the people were actually saying they were little anointed ones. I, there's nothing mocking about that. That's a compliment. But they were saying it as something, something mocking. And when you read Acts, uh, you'll see some amazing uh, things happen. You'll see that they did the miraculous, they did the supernatural, but it said that they did unusual miracles. So they, Peter's shadow healed people. So you think, wow, imagine God anointing somebody. But imagine God anointing somebody's shadow. That that's that's I that to me that's amazing. I just I just think wow. And they took handkerchiefs and they anointed them and they took them to people and they were healed. Uh, we know uh, Peter and John at the, the gate where they said the guy silver and gold we don't have. It doesn't mean they didn't have any money. They maybe just had no change. Uh, but in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So. By this stage, people were seeing them operating in the supernatural. They knew they were anointed as Jesus was anointed. And so that's why they called them the little anointed ones. So we want to get we want to get the blame for that, don't we? We want people to be saying, oh, we see those boys, they're anointed. Mm -hmm. What are they like? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, whether they're saying, <laughs> so whether they're saying it in a good way or a bad way, uh, we want to be anointed. So, John, First John tells us this, but you have an anointing. This is not for a special person. This is not Jesus. This is just your average Joe Christian, Jemima Christian. You have an anointing from the Holy One. You have been set apart, specially gifted, and prepared by the Holy Spirit. See, not a special person. Each one of us have a calling. Each one of us, us have been set apart. Each one of us have been specially gifted and prepared by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we don't recognize it in ourselves. Sometimes it actually takes other people to point it out to us. Sometimes we think, what can I do? And yet every day we're doing something that's very special for people and, and touching people's lives in a way that we're sometimes we're oblivious to. And so you've been set apart, specially gifted and prepared by the Holy Spirit. And they've all... Uh, and all of you know the truth because he teaches us, illuminates our minds and guards us from, from error. So part of this anointing that we talked about, part of this baptism we talked about was to give us power. Part of it was to, to bring purity to our lives. But part of it is to give, bring us into truth. Oh, I love this. All of you know the truth because he teaches us, he illuminates our minds and he guards us from error. See, that's supernatural. How many people, in the, if you walk out into that street tomorrow, 
How many people understand the purposes of God on the earth? How many people understand their purpose on the earth? How many people understand anything about anything that you talk to? You know, it's the world. We have a world of people who understand very little about anything. And yet, we have an anointing that teaches us all things. We have an anointing that lets us know where we are in God's prophetic calendar. We have an anointing that lets us know what God's doing in our city. We have an anointing to know what strongholds are coming against the city. If we press in for those things, we have an anointing to just to know stuff about our business, everyday life. It, it doesn't always have to be. See, God wants to lead us into all truth. He wants to guard us from error, whether it's driving our lorry, whether it's running our curry unit, whether it's Roy and his, his business, whether it's as a family, uh, a parent. Uh, every aspect of it. It's not just spiritual stuff as we tend to uh, think of it. You see, the Hebrew people didn't have a spiritual and a secular that they didn't have a Jew, that's Greek thinking, so the Greeks split the body up into different areas, and particularly secular and spiritual, but the Hebrew people, this is why that word supernatural only is, is a quite a recent invention, if you like, because the Hebrew people, God's people, everything was in, in the round, everything was whole, the secular and the spiritual weren't two separate things. Uh, and so God wants to lead us into all truth, the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into all truth. That's part of the same anointing that's going to cast out the demon is the same anointing that's going to teach you all things. That's going to answer the question you have in mind. Should, should I employ that person? Should I take that person on as a as a as a business person, as a as a customer? Because maybe they're not going to pay me. Well, there's a good chance the Holy Spirit knows that because he's already down the road a bit. And so somebody was just telling me on, on Sunday just they were praying and they had an opportunity to do a business deal, it was £120,000 and that was the value of it over a period of time and just felt the Holy Spirit said, don't do it, in trouble there. And within a few weeks the whole thing, the whole business had folded and they would have had to have taken on staff and then made them off and all. So I thought, mm, this is it's interesting, this, this anointing is supernatural for every, every area of our lives. 2 Corinthians says, all the promises of God in Christ are all answered yes. The King James says, are, are yea and amen for the old timers. Myself. <laughs> now it is God who established and confirms us in joint fellowship with you in Christ and who has anointed us. Now listen, this is one of the ways he anoints us. He has anointed us, empowering us with the gifts of the Spirit. So God, there's a, a science of the supernatural, for want of a better word. There's a way God does it. It's just like our biology. We just don't have a child and say, well, where did that come from? God's made the body. There's a science of the body. There's an anatomy of the body. There's a structure to the universe, uh, as we saw in our movie a, a couple of months ago. And the anointing is the same. The more you understand the science behind, science is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. I'm trying to get a word, the dynamic, if you like, of of the anointing and the dynamic of the supernatural, the more we'll be able to understand it and the more we'll be able to cooperate with God in it. And so, it's God who established and confirms us in joint fellowship with you and in Christ who has anointed us and empowering us with the gifts of the Spirit. I love this scripture, I've always loved this scripture. He has also put his seal on us, certified us as his and given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Uh, like a security deposit to guarantee the fulfillment of, of uh, the promise of eternal life. And so the Holy Spirit is God's down payment for eternity uh, and this whole aspect uh, of eternal life. Uh, and so that, to me that's a, a, powerful, a, a powerful thing. I love that it uses the word eternal life because the Bible sometimes talks about everlasting life. Everlasting life is to do with the length of it. It's everlasting. Eternal life is to do with the quality of it. And, and when you study the word there, it's to do with the God kind of life. And God, of course, it's to do with the length of it as well, because it's, it's, there's no end or no begin to it. But it's to do with the quality <coughs> of it. And, and so, if he has anointed us and empowering us with the gifts of the Spirit, well then we want, we want to know a little bit about those, don't we? So let's 
see what happened next here since there's nothing in front of me. Okay, this is small, hopefully you can see it at the back. Now this is 1 Corinthians and it's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And so, we've talked about this before in one of the earlier uh, sessions that there are nine gifts of the Spirit and nine fruit of the Spirit. I have found down through my years, people tend to focus on one over the other one. Not everybody, but some people as a general rule, I don't know why that is. I, I think we're just probably not balanced people. Balanced people get these equal because some people love all the, the razzmatazz and the glory that comes with the gifts. And, and so the fruit's a bit boring because it seems too uh, every day and seems too ordinary. But to me, it, the fruit's the important bit first and then the gifts come. But we need them both together. We can't leave one or the other out. But, so we're saying we, we're anointed and we, we have this supernatural aspect of our lives through the gifts of the Spirit. So, now there are distinctive varieties of spiritual gifts, special abilities given by the grace and extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit operating in believers, plus us. But it's the same Spirit who grants them and empowers believers. There are distinctive varieties of ministries and service, but it's the same Lord who is served. There are distinctive ways of working to accomplish things, but it's the same God who produces all things and all. So there's a multitude of gifts here because God has a multitude of purposes. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the hospital, you go down to the royal. If you have uh, a throat infection, you go to the ear, nose and throat person. If you have cancer, you go to the cancer specialist. If you want to have a baby, you go to maternity. From <laughs> <laughs> here to maternity. <laughs> so the, there's all different types, but they're all, they're all medical people, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They're all people who are medical, but they're all different types of manifestation of that same <coughs> experience. And, and so it's the same in the body of Christ. If we're the body, everybody, what's the Bible say? Everybody can't be a toe, everybody can't be an ear, everybody can't be an eye, everybody can't be whatever it is. So there's all these different manifestations. It's the same God who produces <coughs> all things and all and all believers, and so this is supernatural. This is not just a natural inspiration, inspiring, energizing, and empowering them. So for instance, when Mary and I were, were in India recently, there maybe 400 people in the meeting, and particularly the year before, we must have prayed and prophesied over <coughs> 600 people in a four day period. Now, we weren't going with the intention of doing that, but as we stood in front of the people, the only way I can describe it is as if a well of words opened up in here. Not not in here, in here, yeah. because I, I'm terrified when I go and stand in front of people. Well, I've said something to this person, there's another 500 of them standing here when we're over a period of time, what am I going to say to the next person? But if I can learn to switch off my brain and tap into the anointing, and the supernatural that, that the Bible is describing to us here, I could stand all day and prophesy over people, and people will come back next year. The number of people that come back nearly the same. People standing in a queue to say, you prophesied this over us last year, and this is what's happened, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Pastor Andrew Pam's on, on today, saying last year, the first year you came, you said X, Y, Z, and that's what's happened. I have no idea how that works. I don't even tr stop trying to work it out. Because if I try to add my two pennies worth to it, then I would be in trouble, and they would be in trouble. I just have to switch my brain off, tap into the flow of the anointing, give what God gives me, and then shut up when it dries up, and move on to the next person. And, and it is an amazing thing. Uh, and uh, the first time we were put, and we were taught and brought up in a, I was Presbyterian, and we went to the Elam for years, and, and the Elam, sort of teaching would have been when the spirit moves you then you if you have a word for somebody you share it you pray with them or, or whatever and uh, first time we went to South Africa uh, we were taken it was quarter past eight in the morning the guy who was called Rocky and he said this is how we do it here he said we have three rooms set up and you and Mary are going to one room there's 24 people in it Dana and someone's going to another one someone's going to another one they have a computer and a disc in it, and you will prophesy over all the people, and uh, it'll be recorded on a disc, and there are pastors there just to make sure uh, 
you're not getting off track sort of thing. I don't even know if he told us that the first time or not. I wanted to find that out afterwards. So we said, we, we don't do that. And so I you five minutes to learn. And so you think you're under pressure at the uh, Sunday night, James. <laughs> and so uh, I said to Barry, well, what can we do? We're, we're the, on the board as international speakers, we're going to have to do something. And so anyway, we go into the room, probably was it the first person that came, the guy with the ring, or early on in the proceedings. Anyway, Mary and I were 50, as God will encourage us in things, because sometimes we can get, if we get put off and fall at the first hurdle, sometimes it's harder to get up. But anyway, we went into this room, and... Uh, we had just been married 25 years, we were both 50, we'd been to Hawaii, Mary had bought me this beautiful ring that was a really, I don't know what colour of blue it was, but never seen anything like it. And the Holy Spirit, I felt the Lord said to me, let me put it that way, give the person the ring and tell them the story. I'm thinking, behold, I'm thinking, I don't even know what I'm doing here. Number two, Mary bought me that ring. I can't very well have an argument with her in front of this man because it's being taped. So I thought, well, we're married 25 years, she'll forgive me. And we'll have, well, we'll have to go back to Hawaii and get another ring. So I said to the guy, look, I said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I said, I really feel God sent to me. I have to give you this ring. And I took it off and it fitted him perfectly. And I said, I have to tell you the story of the ring and I said God just wants you to know this is how much he loves you and I said this ring was bought in paradise and I said Mary and I were, were both 50, we're 25 years married and Mary bought me this ring and told the story and I said God's just saying to you he really loves you and this is so you wake and every morning you're to look at this ring and it will remind you of the love of Jesus and then I said Mary have you anything to share because you know you have to look very spiritual as if you know what you're doing and so Mary's not good at that. She screws her face up and says, what the hell are you asking me for? Uh, and, and so she said, well, really all I'm getting is just God wants you to know he really, really loves you. So that was okay. Prophesied over the rest of the people. This lady came over uh, at the end and said, I just want to let you know I'm the pastor of most of these people. And this is some of the most prof accurate prophetic ministry I've ever heard in my life. So he's like, whew. Uh, so anyway, the next morning, the guy, so I said to me, I hope you didn't mind giving me the ring, and the Lord told me, what are you going to do about it? Sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so the guy, so it was a series of meetings, so the guy came over at the next opportunity and said, guys, you just don't understand uh, what happened there. He said, we had moved from Zimbabwe, he said, my wife and I, he said, we called it our paradise. We we're both 50, we're both 25 years married. We moved from, Z from Zimbabwe because of the troubles to South Africa. We sent all our money, we sent all our stuff because people were setting up a job for us. It was a scam. We lost our life savings. We're now in, in some friend's house. Our daughter was killed in a car accident seven weeks after we arrived here. And he said, I tried to commit suicide a number of times because he said, I thought, I must have done something wicked or evil that God hates me so much that this is this punishment mm -hmm. is coming into the life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said, Mary, what you said just was the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. So Mary thought, well, the little rubbish, because surely I could have thought something better than that. Mm -hmm. But that was the, the, that's what he needed to finish off what was said. So you don't have to be an expert at this stuff. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to even, you, well, you're not going to know. You have to start, it's like priming a pump. You have to say the first bit or do the first bit and then God will give you the rest. Mm -hmm. and, and so God sometimes will put us in awkward situations and uncomfortable situations just to, otherwise it's like kicking the eagle out of the nest. Otherwise we'll just stay comfortable. And, and so, Anyway, that was just to get to this point here. So it's the same spirit. It's the spirit has a purpose. So these gifts are not to make us look good. So a gift, what is a gift? You don't, well, you can't buy a gift for yourself. But generally a gift's for somebody else, isn't it? The gift of God is eternal life. It's not for God, it's for us. And so when God gives us a gift, it's not 
necessarily to make us look good. It does make you look good when the like of that happens because people think, well, there's a really spiritual couple and they're thinking, well, I'm going to hate you. <laughs> and we're just the same as everybody else. But, but God just put us into those, those spots. So, so God has a purpose for these gifts. So it's the same God that produces all things, all and all believe, inspiring, energizing, and empowering them. So what, what happened in that word that we give to those people we were inspired? But you, you wouldn't normally think to give a new ring away. You have to be inspired to do that thing. Well, it's your own money, God. You wouldn't be giving it away. It's a special occasion, blah, blah, blah. You have to be energized to do it. Otherwise, the flesh will tell you, keep it on your finger. Think up something else to tell the guy. Uh, and it empowers you. So to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit, the Spirit of illumination, and the enabling of the Holy Spirit. So spiritual illumination and the enabling of the Holy Spirit for the common good. Now, when, you, when you're when you maybe sometimes operating in these things or, or sensing the anointing, you actually don't often realize it's the Spirit's spiritual illumination. You just think, where did that come from? Now, you begin to learn after a while. Mm, that's not me thinking that. That's the Holy Spirit. But maybe in the early days of beginning to move in the supernatural, move in these things, you think, sure, I just, I, I just thought that up. And I have listened to people think, they just thought that up. <laughs> and so there are people that are wafflers. Uh, but if we're sincere and genuinely seeking after God and wanting to bless people and not doing so that we look good, you know, the Holy Spirit will honor us and lead us in these things. So where are we? So to one is given through the Holy Spirit the power to speak the message of wisdom, or the King James calls it the word of wisdom. So we live in a world where people need wisdom, don't they? People need a word of wisdom. And sometimes we we probably the word of wisdom more often than not, we operate in it sometimes without even realizing. Because you'll maybe have been talked to something, I'm sure we all can think of times where maybe somebody has said to us, you know. I was talking to you last week and you just said something that was just the answer to a question that I had or that just put something in place. And we think, oh, well, that was nice. That was actually probably a word of wisdom that you were operating in and you didn't even realize. And so people don't have wisdom as a general rule, not of common sense either. And so that's why the world is in such a state. And so sometimes when we're just talking to people, we give them, we say something, and it actually is one of the gifts of the Spirit operating. It's a word of wisdom. Sometimes you're in a situation or you're in a meeting situation, and then it, it's something that flows in a meeting. But I think we have closeted the gifts of the Spirit and created a designer church set of gifts that we don't use out there. And actually, I think they were designed for out there rather than in here. It doesn't mean they can't be used in here. But generally speaking, we begin to be naturally supernatural and flow in them as we talk to people. We can be ministering life to people and operating in many of these gifts without them even knowing. So Jesus said to the woman, well, what was Jesus doing when he was operating, talking to the woman at the well? Well, he was operating in the next one, a word of knowledge. He said, go and tell, go and fetch your husband. And said, well, or he told her, you know, uh, the man that you have now is not your husband and you have five others and blah 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 it was a word of knowledge but, but what happened she became one of the first evangelists of Jesus ministry it said she and I told the whole city amazing come and hear a man here's the, here's the power of this I love this so Jesus had one word of knowledge for the, the woman and she went and told said, come and hear a man that told me everything I ever did he didn't tell her everything she ever did. But that's how she perceived it. That's the power of the supernatural. You can say one little thing to somebody and all of a sudden that person thinks, God knows all about me. That's the power of it. That's why evangelism through the gifts of the Spirit is such a powerful thing. You say something to somebody that they know nobody knows. They'd be their closest friend, but they know you definitely don't know it. And you say it to them through even naturally working in a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, all of a sudden they think, well, God's in my case. God knows where I live. There's somebody who knows all about me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it is an amazing thing. So word of, uh, word of knowledge and understanding uh, according to the same spirit. To another, so I've highlighted these in yellow, so you see there's nine, nine different ones. To another, wonder-working faith is given. So we've all got faith. 
But then there's a the gift of faith. And so it's a supernatural faith. It's, it's over and above your ordinary faith. It's a gift of faith that God gives us. So the Bible says in, in, in Romans 12, God's given to every man uh, the gift of faith. They're given uh, faith to everyone, the gift of faith to everyone. So we all have faith. You couldn't believe in Jesus for your salvation if you didn't have faith. And so to me, faith's like a muscle. Uh, and so I like what it says. He, he's given to every person the measure of faith. And so I believe everybody gets the same faith. Uh, depends then what you do with it. So to me, faith's like a muscle. If you don't operate, it'll stay small. If you do operate, it'll grow big. But this is a gift of faith on top of that. So sometimes there are things in life that just are overwhelming us, maybe. Or we need to pray for a situation and God can just drop a gift of faith into our heart. That when you pray, you, you, we talked about intercession and we talked about knocking, knock, 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 knock. Um, there's the Bible talks about the importunate widow where the, the woman kept knocking and the, the wicked judge did up because they said, for goodness sake, I'm not going to get to sleep tonight. But there's, when the gift of faith drops into your heart, you know that you know that you know that you know the answer's on the way. Uh, and so that's a whole, that's, that's a, something very special. Uh, so to another, uh, extraordinary gifts of healings. Uh, and so... He, if some people, I hear people saying this, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of undecided on this, and I think both are true, maybe is a better way to put it. I hear people saying, I have the gift of healing, and I do believe there are people who operate in the gift of healing. But the Bible teaches very clearly here, the Holy Spirit gives out the gifts as He wills. Mm -hmm. So, which is the most important gift? Well, the one that's needed at the time. And so if you're dying and you need a healing, well, it's not the gift of tongues you need. Or, well, it could be a word of knowledge because there could be something in your past that's hindering your healing. But the most important gift is the gift at the time. So I think we can restrict ourselves. Some people, that's their area of ministry, just like the doctors. You've got your specialists, I understand that. But I think we shouldn't limit ourselves to, so the Bible teaches that we seek earnestly the best gifts. So the best gift, if it's a gift for somebody else, is the one that the person needs at the time. So if you've never operated in a gift before and somebody's in need, well, why not ask God, Lord, release this gift to me yeah, for this person? Right. So what a what a, a wonderful thing, because that ties in with the fruit of the Spirit as well, as we'll see in a minute. Oh, yeah. It also, so how, how do you um, interpret when it says, healings rather than but which I don't think is a multiplication it's diversity would you, yeah, would you think, see it as multiplication or yeah some of the different translations give, yeah I think there's 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 two things that there's uh, it doesn't mention the gift of uh, miracles in that, does it? Yeah, no, it no, does no, it's no, the no, of miracles no, that's so, new merit. yeah so if you take miracles that's something to me, a miracle is something it doesn't have to necessarily be a healing, it could be a miracle in any mm -hmm. area of it. Jesus walked in water, that's a miracle. He turned Changing the water the into wine and <laughs> changed yeah. the weather. Yeah. So miracles are something unusual, but there can be miracles of healing. But healings can be can I believe healings can be instant. I believe they can be over a period of time. I believe they can be diverse in, in lots of, of, of different ways. I think the word healings is used because God's not going to be boxed into yeah. to one narrow uh, definition of that. Uh, and so the, miracle, the working of miracles uh, to another prophecy uh, for telling the future, speaking a new message from God to the people. I always tell people prophecy will never contradict the Logos. So, you know, I hear people saying, well, God told me this, or they give people words and... and I just you don't get a witness with it because it doesn't line up with scripture. God will never God's not schizophrenic, he'll never contradict himself. No, that's and that's the safeguard for that. Uh, so discernment of spirits. We talked a little bit about this on Sunday night, and this is so important. And I believe it's more even than it's just saying here. It says the ability to distinguish sound godly doctrine from deceptive doctrine of man-made religion and cults. Mm -hmm. And so we've we've been actually looking at the Apostles' Creed, and so even as I've been studying that. It's so important to discern, so when you look at the Christadelphians, or however you pronounce it, 
So they call themselves Christians, but they don't believe that Jesus was sinless. They believe he's a created man. Well, some people you see in, in Christian circles say, well, so what does it matter? Well, it matters a whole lot because then Jesus didn't have the legal right to die for our sins mm -hmm. because he was a sinner. Mm -hmm. There needed to be a spotless, sinless Lamb of God, and that comes through the bloodline of the Father and all the stuff we've talked about over the, the past three weeks. So, weeks. Mm -hmm. so we need to be able to discern between good teaching, bad teaching, but also discerning of spirits. Uh, and so th this whole thing of discerning of spirits is not just the spirit behind the doctrine, but is the discerning of spirits of... So, yeah, I remember a lady coming to me one day and said, you need to pray for me, I've got a demon. And I said, no, you've just got a stinging attitude. And she said, laugh me the way she went. And this was in church. And uh, I said, well, whatever. Because just, I said, you're just an attention seeker. Yeah. And, and so we need to be able to discern there's people who are lovely and they're full of demons. And there are people who... Okay. are not so nice and actually just have bad manners and they just they maybe just need trained, they need a bit of an education. Uh, we talked about some of those things, it's about strongholds and creating landing pads for the, the enemy. Most of the people I have prayed for, uh, for deliverance from demonic activity, let's call it like that, most of them were Christians, were claiming to be Christians. So there's a whole theological discussion to say, well, uh, can a Christian have a demon? Well, a Christian can have whatever it likes, but not in their spirit. We're, we're triune beings, we're spirit, we're soul, and we're body. It represents the outer court and the inner court. So in our spirit, we're as righteous. That's where we're righteous. We're as righteous as we'll ever be. That's where the imputed righteousness is. But it's like the outer courts, the flesh, and those things... There's things that people do and things that people create legal land. You can still be a Christian and give legal land in parts for the enemy. Uh, and that's why it's not very sensible to do. But it's one of those things. So discern the spirits, that's a big one. That You can never do a whole night on that. Um, to another various kinds of unknown tongue. To another in interpretation of tongues. And so the word there is not translation. The word is interpretation. So I don't know if you've, if you've heard tongues before, maybe you haven't heard tongues before and sometimes you'll hear tongues and then you'll hear somebody speak in English and you think, that doesn't say that's only half the length of time. Uh, but it was interesting, we were in India when we were translating and the pastor there and the pastor's sister, um, because people say, well, tongues sounds ridiculous to me, but any language sounds ridiculous if you don't know it. You go to India, it sounds ridiculous but you just know they're speaking Indian or Hindi or whatever they're speaking. And so I remember when Mary was speaking, and, uh, and probably the same when I was speaking, but the pastor's sister particularly, she seemed to take four times the length of, of time to say what I was saying or what Mary was saying. So we said afterwards, you know, your word's longer than ours. Or what? But she said, no, I'm not doing a direct translation. I'm interpreting and I'm, I'm adding in because these people are brand new Christians. So sometimes you're saying stuff that they have no idea what in the word about that. So you're maybe used, where you speaking to people that have some idea about Christianity. Many of these people are just new believers or from the tea gardens. They don't have a Christian background or they were uh, Hindus. And so they have all sorts of weird and wonderful understandings of things. So she'll maybe something that we say that we don't understand needs a little bit of explanation in their culture and their understanding, she'll take the time to do that, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, tongues and interpretation, uh, not tongues and translation. And, and so, uh, that's, that's another, words are important. All these things, the gifts, the achievements, the abilities, the empowering, are brought about by the one's self-same Holy Spirit, distributing to each individual just as he chooses. There's another verse in a little slide or two here, I think, which is interesting. It says that tongues are a, an, a supernatural sign to the unbeliever, and prophecy is a sign to the believer. And I, I never get that, because I think tongues are just freak unbelievers out. <clears throat> well, God knows what he's doing. Who am I to, to say? So, uh, we also thank God continually. So here we've been talking about the gifts of the Spirit and the power that the gifts of the Spirit, they, they give us an answer. So we understand the anointing, the Holy Spirit comes, He anoints us. 
uh, we've responded to the Word of God, we understand the Word of God, and here we're going to say a little bit more about the Word now, we begin to operate and begin to dip our toe, if you like, into the gifts of the Spirit. And everybody has to start somewhere, and, and uh, we all have to grow in these things. So we also thank God, the Apostle says, continually for this, that when you receive the Word of God concerning salvation, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a word of mere men, but as it truly is, the Word of God. And look, here's what the Word of God is doing in us. I, I love this. Which is effectually at work in you who believe, listen, exercising its inherent supernatural power in those of faith. Well, we're people of faith, aren't we? We're believers, we're people who've received the word concerning salvation. So that word that we have received, that word that we are reading, that word that we're studying, that word that we're listening to tonight, so we think, well, this is an hour and a half, or whatever, nearly finished. Uh, we don't understand what this word is doing in our spirits. We don't, you see, this word of God, because we're reading a lot of scripture tonight, so this is the, this is the word of God, it's not just Brian's word. I'm throwing in a few odds and ends, but this is a lot of scripture here tonight. So this word of God is effectually working in us who believe, exercising its inherent. So it inherent means to be built in. So when we receive the word of God, built into the word of God is supernatural power that's working in us. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah, yeah. So you wonder why you're feeling different. You wonder why you come into the meeting and you sense God's presence or you feel a tingle. You've said to me, James, you feel a tingle up your spine. Yeah. Was it any wonder? Because the word of God is it's inherently it's supernatural power in us is doing mm. something, changing us into the image of Jesus, causing us to understand the purpose of God for us taking out the trash, as we read earlier on, dealing with the stuff that's going to hinder us. Uh, and so, the word, so, so important. I don't, I don't know how many slides even there's left, because my things in here will be okay for another five minutes or so. Uh, Second Peter says, His grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power, listen to this, His divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. This is one of my favourite verses in the whole Bible. He's given us all things through the knowledge of Jesus. He's given us all things uh, that pertain unto life and unto godliness. Yeah. Not just godliness, unto life and godliness. Everything to do with our lives, God has given us a divine power. Through his divine power has given us everything that we need to live a good life and live a godly life. We're without excuse. Yeah. There's no excuses. There's no point. When we get to heaven, we're not going to go and say, Well, God, I had a raw deal. He said, Hold on, I've given you all things that pertain unto yeah. life and godliness yeah. through the knowledge of Him. If we're not operating in it, it's because we're not operating in the knowledge of Him that we should be operating in. Who called us by glory and virtue. And this, this is even better. By which he has given to us exceeding great and precious promises. So the word is full of promises. I don't know, the Bible students will be able to, many promises are in the word. They teach you that down at the Bible school. I think they do, but I can't remember. It's like 12,000 or something. There's, there's enough for every day of the week, two or three There's definitely at least, all of your life. at least one on every page. <laughs> And so he's given us these exceeding great and precious promises. Listen, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Mm -hmm. Wow. Partakers of the divine nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the word, when you look up that word divine there, it's the Godhead. It's the nature of the Godhead. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so the more we read the word, the more we immerse ourselves in the Word, the more we get to know Jesus, the more we understand He's given us all these things that pertain unto life and godliness, the more we become partakers of the divine nature. So we looked at the gift. So what, when you think of the divine nature, think of Jesus. Sometimes we, when we think of, of the divine nature, it's easy to visualize Jesus. And, and so we think of all, the, so Jesus exemplifies the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't he? We've talked about the gifts of the Spirit. And so Jesus, the divine nature exemplifies, yes, the power, all that stuff's there, but the divine nature is much more than power. The divine nature is the exemplification of the, of the fruit of the Spirit in the life of Jesus. 
But the fruit of the Spirit, the result of His presence within us, is love and unselfish concern for others, joy, inner peace, not just a peace that comes because of circumstances, patience, I love this, not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. That's a challenge to me anyway. And uh, there's one to give James a hard time for. Yeah. There's the next time we sit at a junction. So not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there's no law. That's describing Jesus, isn't it? But that's, the, that's describing the divine, the Godhead, the divine nature, which we are becoming part, which we are partakers of yes. Yes, through the exceeding great and precious promises. It's not just a verse in a Bible. It's not just a Bible. It's a living, vibrant, living Word of God. It's the Logos. It's the Rhema. It's the incarnate Word. That's why the Bible talks about Christ being formed in us. The Word of Christ, the anointed Word, being formed in us. Against, uh, there's nothing can come against you when you're operating in these things. One or two more slides. For our, so we're talking about some of these things. This, so we need to un, understand all this stuff because here's part of our battle. Jesus said, so what did Jesus say? He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to deal with these things, to set the captives free. Because the captives don't know this stuff. The captives don't know what we know. The captives can't set themselves free. The captives need somebody who knows God, who understands the anointing, who understands the word, who understands their purpose to come and help them be set free. Isn't that right? That's us. Whether we like it or not, whether we realize it or not, it's not going to happen in church, is it? Because 95% of the people are not in church. 90% of the people are not in church. The ones that get into church will get them set free. But this is going to have to happen outside of church. This is where we're, we're running LCC Community Trust. We had 40 people here today, Lindsay, was it 30? No, I was had 20. 20. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so these people are on a church crawl, which is wonderful. People want to find out about churches. So they've been to the synagogue, they've been to the Baha'i faith, they've been to wherever, wow. and they come here. And so uh, it's great when people are ringing you to say, can we bring people? So I didn't hear Lindsay, but I told you about an excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. this morning, so, uh, and so we need to let these people know that we have the answer. Mm -hmm. we, we are the answer uh, because we have the answer. Yeah. So our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We talked a little bit about this on Sunday night about when you set up something in here for 20 people and then they don't turn up and get, and get off. But our, see our battle is not with the people. Our battle is with the spirit that's controlling the people. And so they're in a supernatural battle. Now they have the will and the choices and all those things that they can make. We understand that. But they don't know necessarily sometimes how to break out of those things, how to make those choices. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the weird forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. And so there are, in, above us in the heavens, the Bible tells us, that Satan's the prince of the power of the air. Until this whole thing's wrapped up, he still has a certain amount of control. We know Jesus said it's finished, but it won't be fully wrapped up until there's that new heaven and new earth when we enter into eternity. So we're still mopping up the, the last bits of the declaration of victory uh, in the world and God has some purposes to fulfill before Jesus returns. So we need to understand, so how are we going to fight this heavenly supernatural battle need a big ladder or we could pray <laughs> so this is one of the reasons we've been doing the prayer course this is one of the reasons we're praying because this battle is in prayer this battle is understanding the anointing this battle is understanding who we are uh, the word of god the, the name of jesus uh, when he deceived Jesus on the cross, and when he disarmed the rulers and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. So they're already defeated. Mm -hmm. So but sometimes they don't, they don't seem to know they're defeated. <laughs> they need just one final. We're going to talk a little bit about this on Sunday. So they descended into hell. 
and that's a whole interesting part of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, we talked about this earlier, uh, therefore unknown tongues are meant as a supernatural sign, not to believers, but to unbelievers who might be, rece who might be receptive by prophecy foretelling the future, speaking a new message from God to the people is not for unbelievers, but for believers. Brian, list. can I just say um, there were two things I could give testimony on that. When I was a young Christian, I used to speak in tongues quite a lot in a meeting. Right. And um, um, my brother in law, who was a pastor of the church, we were meeting in a house then. Um, he had his landlord come round to a meeting, and I spoke in tongues, and um, it was interpreted. And it cut into the heart, you know, and he declared that God was in us. Mm. Now, it was the tongue, which doesn't make sense, you're right. Yeah. It, it was the tongue that kind of op opened him up mm -hmm. to hear the word of God. And um, Terence has had that as well. But also, just last week, one of our teens were in Scotland, and they were in a meeting, and um, someone gave a tongue, and there was a guy there from Africa from uh, a tribe that had, that was a bit, it wasn't a common tribe, but they had 21 different dialects mm -hmm. in this tribe. Somebody gave a tongue, and it was exactly, he was, he was sort of not really in the meeting, um, fiddling around with a little girl, and uh, somebody gave a tongue, and it was his. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden... It got his attention. Yeah, it got his attention mm. and brought him to God. So yeah. it is. I've heard maybe five or six testimonies over the years yeah. of things that have happened and the people didn't know they were speaking in a, even in a language that we do know, like yeah. Italian or something, and somebody was in the meeting. Mm -hmm. And that has to be supernatural, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah we you can't make that up. <laughs> like it up. You yeah. couldn't make it up. So have I heard a number of testimonies of that sort of thing happening, which is fantastic. So. So the more we understand the word, the more we know and understand the authority that's in Jesus' name, the more we engage and flow with the anointing, just as I was using the example of Mary and I were thrown into the deep end, I would have to say, and we were Christians quite a while at that stage, but operating in a different manifestation of the spirit, if you like, but somebody just took us and kicked us in, and we had no choice, and it was sink or swim. And so, so we very quickly learned a whole lot of things in that few days. Uh, and so the more we understand, so when we come into a meeting, even in church, if we can pick, we pick. So sometimes I say things in the service, have you, have you ever noticed? Uh, maybe in between the songs, nearly every week someone will come and say to me, that was a word for me, let's say something, just maybe pick up a line of a song or... I shared something in, in the middle of a preaching a few weeks ago. I said, that's a prophetic word for somebody. I can't even remember what it was now. This couple came and said, that was a word for us that just answered something. So we learn to pick these things up in a, in a service. We can, if we pick up something, we can pray. So could kind of everybody trips up the front. You'll never get the meeting over. And we've been in those certain meetings for years when it became a free-for-all. And just it became everybody's two minutes of whatever. And it just freaks out the people who are trying to reach the on church. Uh, and so there's times and there's places, and the Bible says the spirit of the prophet, subject to the prophet. But the more we understand about the anointing outside of church also, so when you're in a business meeting, when you're, and I have to be so careful now because I'm so used with meetings, I'm in business meetings, and I've seen myself several times almost as if we were close to where to pray. And then hold on, I'm in a different meeting here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, but we still can operate in the word in the name of Jesus and the anointing. And it's because we need to, sometimes in a business meeting, we need a word of knowledge. Sometimes we need discernment. To think, should, I, should I actually be saying this person up as a customer or not? Because it could cause us a lot of uh, problems down the road. So the more we get into the word, the word has inherent power, it's supernatural, it does. You see, I love that story where it says about the disciples and the message, I think it says, the disciples followed Jesus around, they listened to what he said, uh, and they watched what he did. But one day, then he said, now it's time for you to be sent out. And they were dopes, like for three years, they had no idea where it was blown up or stopped, what was going on. But it was almost as if they imbibed it, it was almost as if, as they listened to the word, as they walked with the anointing, as they walked with Jesus, 
and they walked under the anointing, all of a sudden the penny dropped, and then the day of Pentecost, when God released the Spirit uh, to the church, uh, then they, they stepped into a whole new dimension uh, of things. As you can see, we're only scrape on the surface here. This is just like a baseline to, but I think it'd be good to pick these up maybe at some later stage, go this a little bit deeper. Uh, so the more we understand and experience a life, the more we do those things, the more we will understand and experience a life that's naturally supernatural. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've met people, that's the last one, yeah. I've met people who are really spiritual and supernatural on a Sunday and during the week you think you were working with the devil and I think something not right there uh, and so we need to we need to be the same all the time we need to be uh, naturally supernatural because if we're supernaturally natural we'll freak if we're supernaturally supernatural we will, you know, we're freaking people out but if you can just be natural and give somebody a word of knowledge in there, say, I keep telling them, right? And friends, says, you don't have to keep coming and telling me, thus saith the Lord unto thee, my brother. Well, that's just somebody that doesn't have confidence that it is the word of the Lord. Because I'm, how can I argue with it? If somebody comes, thus saith the Lord unto thee, and go and take a jump or whatever it is. <laughs> if I say, thus saith the Lord, I'm, 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 putting a, I'm putting you in a bind. Yes, yes. But people don't have confidence in the, in the gifting that they carry sometimes, or it's just like a religious thing. Yeah. And so you don't have to particularly say, so it makes no difference if you say to the person, you know, I really I feel, mm -hmm. I just sense this for you, or I feel the Lord said, if it's in a church meeting, if it's in a business meeting, you can just say, have you ever, you can just ask, you can word the question in such a way that it's totally natural. But it actually could be ministering a word of knowledge, mm -hmm. it could be ministering a word of wisdom, it could be ministering a word of life to somebody and so if we can learn to do that all of a sudden we'll see all these things beginning to to grow and develop it's in so many ways and, and that's where god wants i believe to take us as individuals as we now are reaching into so many different everyday things even in, in the community stuff we're doing these are these are opportunities just to minister to people whether it's in our families whether it's in that whether it's in the workplace whether it's in school whatever but without freaking people out. You don't have to freak anybody out to be supernatural. Mm -hmm. And if you start praying for somebody and they start foaming at the mouth and rolling the floors, <laughs> just, <laughs> just pray all the harder and uh, send for the pastor. Send for Mary. <laughs> and it, I'm not saying it won't happen. Yeah. You know, an interesting story, and I'll finish with this. I was in... Uh, Toronto, I heard a guy speaking, uh, he was a psychiatrist, and so he was a good Presbyterian, uh, and a nominal Presbyterian at that, And uh, but he had watched a few things in the Christian channel, and he was speaking to a lady one day, and she started speaking to him in a man's voice, and uh, something strange here, and then as he was talking to her and trying to suss it out, he thought, so that guy in the Christian channel says he's something about the name of Jesus. <laughs> and, and so he, he thought, I bet I'll try this. So he wasn't Christian, but he just had never experienced any of this sort of thing. So then he said, under his breath, he said, he said, be quiet in the name of Jesus. The woman just yeah. calmed down because she's getting really disturbed. And then he stopped for about and then away she went again. So then he said, be quiet in the name of Jesus. And so over a period of time, he said, there's something in this, so that and cost him, caused him to investigate the whole thing. So he ended up, to cut a long, long story short, he uh, wrote a book called Breaking the Chains. And he went into the whole history of this and, and setting people free. And even on, so he was able to say, there was, he, he discovered that a lot of the people he was dealing with, even their grandparents or parents had been the Masonic and had been in different occult things and played with Ouija boards. And the, you know, we read that scripture with the, the Jews on Sunday. It said, let his blood be on our children and our children's children. There's people open up things over their families uh, that become curses and, and the, the need broken. And, and those meetings were, they were scary because this guy, there's people come up for prayer and this guy then said, well, no, let me pray for him. Just, he very gently lifted his hand to pray for one moment. And she must have shot 12 feet off the ground down to where, where David was. But she got up and she said, I feel free. I 
she says, I've had this choking thing over my life for 20 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. says, my grandfather was in, in the Masonic. And she said, they take something with the, the I, don't know, the, I don't know much about the Masonic, but there's something about the hangman's loose and loose and all this sort of thing. So he said he's discovered a lot of illnesses and a lot of things that people have with their heart, with their throat, with their bowels, because they, they don't know where to say that, you know, take out my bowels and the entrails and all the rest of it. So he said these, these actually open up legal things for the enemy, because this is a real, the supernatural is a real world. Uh, and so that's not maybe the place to start on your yeah. first day, but as we ease into it, as we get into the word, we realize, hold on, there's a hope. And I believe as, what did Jesus say? As it comes closer to the end, the world will get darker, but the church will get brighter. Yeah. Uh, and he said, the, the glory of this latter house will be greater than that of the former house. So the former, if the former house had people's shadows healing people, that has to happen again and greater than that. that the former house of people been carried out of cheap church first because the light of the Holy Spirit that's supernatural. And so that's when revival will start. Somebody dies in church because they've lied to God. And uh, <laughs> after that, in the Acts, if you actually read that, yeah. in the Acts it said there have been added to the church daily, and after mm -hmm. Ananias and Sapphira, they multiplied. Mm -hmm. When you think of them in the opposite, you think people say, oh, oh, no, no, we're not going there, mm -hmm. but actually it was the opposite. So the supernatural is an amazing thing. And so, what it does still, okay, that's really spooky, some have been dropping dead. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be weird, spooky. Uh, we can we can operate in these things without being weird. And uh, sometimes people's reaction will be weird. That's not our responsibility, but we don't have to be weird. Are we still rolling? Uh, that, that's us finished now. If you want to put it up.